My sins are gone. 421, if you're able to stand with us, we'll invite you to do so as we sing tonight. 421, my sins are gone. You ask me why I'm happy, and I'll just tell you why. Because my sins are gone. Number 421, let's stand together. And it's awful hard to sing this song if you don't put a little bit of a smile on your face. Amen? So you got to kind of like, he asked me why I'm happy. <laughs> right? Uh, you might, might want to work on that a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> Number 421. Help me out. You asked me why I'm happy, so I'll just tell you why. Because my sins are gone. And when I meet the scoffers, who ask me where they are, I say, my sins are gone. They're underneath the blood on the cross of Calvary, as far removed as darkness is from dawn. In the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me. Praise God. My sins are gone. T'was at the old time altar where God came in my heart. And now my sins are gone. The Lord took full possession. The devil did depart. I'm glad my sins are gone. There underneath the blood on the cross of Calvary, as far removed as darkness is from dawn, in the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. When Satan comes to tempt me and tries to make me doubt, I say, my sins are gone. You got me into trouble, but Jesus got me out. I'm glad my sins are gone. There underneath the blood on the cross of Calvary, as far removed as darkness is from dawn, in the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. I'm living now for Jesus. I'm happy night and day because my sins are gone. My soul is filled with music. With all my heart I say, I know my sins are gone. There underneath the blood on the cross of Calvary, as far removed as darkness is from dawn, in the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me. Praise God. My sins are gone. Amen. Let's bow our heads together. Father, we thank you for the fact that we can say tonight that our sin has been covered under the blood. Thank you that we know that we have that forgiveness. And as we were talking even this morning, we have this confidence that we know this very thing, that absent from the body, present with the Lord. So we're thankful today for that truth. We're thankful, Lord, that we have a way uh, to have that uh, remission of our sin. I pray, Lord, that you would Allow your Holy Spirit tonight to bring a challenge to our hearts. Be Brother Tim a little bit as he'll bring the message. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, allow him to have the liberty he needs to deliver the message you laid upon his heart and help us to not just be hearers but doers of your word. We ask that all that will be said and done, that you might receive the praise, the honor, and the glory. We'll thank you in advance. We ask our precious Savior's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. And uh, a couple quick announcements, and then maybe, Tim, you might have something you might want to say in a little bit. Um, we've got uh, a couple of prayer requests we mentioned this morning, and I asked you to include, uh, we kind of used this morning as a lighthouse theme, you might say, uh, three churches that with the name Lighthouse in it, Swickley Lighthouse uh, Baptist Church down in Swickley, PA, uh, Brother Rick Gelfin and... Uh, uh, Mrs. Gelfin are, are there at the church, 
actually pray for them. They actually started today a revival meeting with Brother Bray Dombeck, uh, a Beams revival meeting. And so you can be in prayer for that. Um, and I know each night they have, have another speaker there, and all of a sudden, every one of them escapes my brain. Uh, but they're basically local pastors that they have. I know I think it's on Tuesday night, Brother uh, Ron Royalty from Poland, Ohio, I think is going to be there uh, speaking on Tuesday night. I'm, I'm not sure, but I know that he told me um, when I saw him Friday night. Uh, he was supposed to, but he had to cancel. Um, anyhow, they will be having services each night, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, for uh, the Beams Revival. And that is at the Swickley Lighthouse Baptist Church. Okay, So pray for them this week. And then we've got uh, the Lighthouse Baptist Church in Sandusky, Ohio. Uh, this was previously under the leadership of Brother Mick. Ask you to be in prayer for them. Uh, going through a lot of decisions right now. Need a lot of wisdom and direction there. So let's keep them in prayer. And then the, the Lighthouse Baptist Church on State Line Road in Bessemer with Brother Greg Simpson. So we kind of took the opportunity today to ask you to pray for the churches to be a good lighthouse. And that would include us as well, even though we don't have a lighthouse in our name, per se. Uh, the church is often looked at as being a lighthouse in the community, warning people of the dangers, and also showing light to direct them to safety. And so that's what we need to be doing. Amen? And so we ask that you would uh, pray for them. And we did mention also a couple other pastors and, and churches this morning as well. Uh, Brother Lott, uh, and the New Testament Baptist Church in Butler, and uh, all of a sudden escaped me. Uh, Brother Jeremy we had on the list, also Brother Troyer from Grace Baptist Church up in Greenville, and uh, Brother Schwartz and Mrs. Schwartz. I got to talk to them yesterday a little bit um, from Mercer. Uh, They're Bible Baptist Church in Mercer, and um, I think the list continues to go on. We've got several on our list here. Um, and we had a few other prayer requests to go along with that. Also, I asked you to pray for Donnie and physical needs just for strength, uh, trying to get some weight put on. Uh, I think he told me uh, the other day on Friday that he thought he'd gained uh, maybe one or two pounds. Uh, you know, that's not a lot when you lost 27, and he needs to get back up there just, you know, nourishment-wise and strength. So uh, keep him in prayer, and uh, Lord willing, uh, you know, we can try to keep them out of the hospital for a while. That's the idea. So keep it, keep that going. Um, there was another, I remember what it was. I know we had another one this morning I mentioned to you. I didn't ha I don't have them in front of me. That's on my list, but Rachel, remember? Oh, Miss Nancy. That's what it was. I had to think back here. Nancy uh, brought a prayer request this morning, sent it to us, asking for special prayer for her and Rex. Uh, had recently maybe done some blood work, and the if if you didn't have a health issue before you had the blood work done, you would have a heart condition after you got the bill for the blood work. So uh, it was quite astronomical on what was sent to them for the billing on that. Uh, so pray for them that they can you know somehow get that taken care of, and also maybe maybe there was a mistake, maybe they overcharged or something. I don't know. It sounded pretty excessive to me, uh, but what do I know? Uh, but I would ask you to pray for Nancy and for her husband. We've had them on the prayer list. ask you to pray for them a little bit more on that. Uh, anybody else? Prayer request. Uh, Rachel? Amen. Amen. Big answer to prayer there for Nancy as we have been praying for Rex, and uh, he was having some job issues, kind of concerns, but that was kind of taken care of, but also uh, physical needs, but doing better. Okay, amen. Mm -hmm.
What's her first name? Bryn. B R I N N. Bryn. B, like in Bob. B, 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 B R I N N. Okay, I got it. Bryn. And you said this is Keith's daughter, correct? Okay. All right. So pray for Bryn. She's about six, maybe eight years old, having long periods of seizures each day. They're trying to get her medicine regulated to help to regulate that. And they've been having difficulty. And of course, then having continual seizures uh, makes it not only hard on her, but on the family trying to work through it. So they're doing all this juggling with five different medicines. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure I'm following that. Okay. So a lot of uh, needs there for Bryn. And uh, she's six, between six and eight years old. And having multiple seizures and needs a lot of prayer. Okay. Got it down there. Alicia. Okay. All right. Continue to pray for Alicia's friend's mom for just a special unspoken request, right? Okay. All right. We'll put that down there. And I have this morning several special unspoken also. I ask you to pray for those and uh, some future doctor appointments and things we'll be going to do between myself and, and Grandma. And um, also Terry asked a special prayer this morning for Carl, her, her brother uh, there in Nevada and needing uh, some ongoing treatments and stuff. He's having some complications with his cancer. So need to, need to have some prayer there as well. All right, anybody else? Yeah, Alicia. When he gets what, honey? Oh, he's going tomorrow? Okay. Okay. So he's trying to go tomorrow to purchase the vehicle. Okay. All right. So pray for Alicia's friend here going to purchase the truck tomorrow. So pray the Lord will work through all of that. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Rachel had something else? Okay, uh, Rachel remind us to pray for Bonnie, her boss, uh, traveling to Cleveland tomorrow. And uh, also on Monday, tomorrow, Rachel will be filling in for her in her absence while Bonnie's out of town. Uh, on Mondays, they have a uh, session that they do for the hair salon at the Lakeview uh, nursing center, and uh, so on Monday, Rachel will be taking up the slack in Bonnie's absence tomorrow to help cover the salon there. So you can pray for Bonnie traveling and Rachel filling in. Amen. So keep that in prayer. Also, traveling, Kimberly is going to be doing some traveling this week, uh, visiting a friend there in Maryland. So pray for traveling mercy for Kim. All right. Anybody want to go to the East Coast? Talk to her. If you want to go to the the uh, the mistake on the lake, talk to Bonnie. Amen. <laughs> I think they found out it was a mistake today. I didn't get to watch it, but I heard the Browns and the Steelers played today. So there you go. All right, that was the mistake. <clears throat> I think they showed up. I did hear the final score was like seven to forty nine or something like that. Yeah, something like that. Browns were in trouble today, yes. Okay, uh, anybody else? Prayer requests? Any other testimonies? Blessing? Yes, yes, sir. Edgar? Okay, pray for the Edgar family as the hubby passed... Uh, last night, 
and you say she's been associated with the company for about 40 years okay employee okay right just want to make sure i'm following that okay so pray for the edgar family long time employee with the company that tim works with here and her husband passed away last night so let's keep that in prayer all right okay raiden is that your hand back here you got a prayer request buddy pray for your dad all right all right raiden asking prayer for dad all right let's pray for joe Amen. All right. And Joe Sider down here. Yeah. But she got it back. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's the big thing, getting the stuff replaced that needs to be replaced, right? Praise the Lord. Bag came up missing at Walmart, but they found it. And uh, that saves Joe having to dupl duplicate and remake keys and stuff. So, And uh, praise the Lord, it was only a coupon book that was inside the bag and not cards and IDs and all that jazz. So, All right, praise the Lord. Bag was found. Amen. All right. Okay, uh, Deanna. Mm -hmm. Me? <laughs> me? <laughs> right. It's like me. I'm <laughs> it's back here, like, really? I didn't know that's what was going to happen. So uh, sometime this week, right, on Thursday. Okay, so pray for William. Uh, we've got a doctor appointment Thursday, and they'll be uh, doing a virtual meeting with the doctor and going over meds and some possible doing some things with his situation there too. Amen. Okay, and Christopher, I think you go Tuesday to orthopedic, right? Tuesday, ortho. Okay, pray for Christopher on Tuesday. He goes in for his knee to be looked at again. And uh, so pray for that, right? <laughs> he worked for an extra three hours this afternoon on a, on a uh, book report that he had to turn in for school. And uh, praise the Lord, it's done. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Book done. Amen. So, praise the Lord for that. All right. Pray that he gets a good grade on it. He spent an extra three hours on it today just trying to fix it up to get extra points. And, you know, the teacher gave some instructions of some minimal things that he had to do. And uh, he can maybe get some extra points and stuff for the layout and doing certain things. And so he spent a little extra time putting some thought to it. And, and uh, I think it turned out pretty good. So pray that he gets a shining grade, a, a, a good score. Uh, if it comes back bad, that's <laughs> not going to be good. Amen? So I'm confident. It may just be a matter of how tired the teacher is for having to read all the other reports when they get to yours, right? Okay, that was good. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Brother Tim up here, you're at the top of the alphabet, so you'll be okay. You'll get yours early. <laughs> Amen. All right. <clears throat> Anybody else? Prayer request. All right. Well, um, tell you what, let's go ahead and sing another song, and then we'll come back and have prayer here before Brother Tim comes, okay? So, um, where were we at, Kim? 403? 403. 403 in your songbook. 403.
All right, 403. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Amen? Wonderful. How do you, how do, you do wonderful, Kim? It's like, like it. Wonderful. Huh? It's full of wonder. Wonderful. Okay. Number 403. Let's stand together as we sing. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Amen. All right. <clears throat> Join in here as we sing together on that first verse. There will never be a sweeter story, story of the Savior's love divine, love that brought him from the realms of glory, just to save a sinful soul like mine. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful it is to me? Boundless as the universe around me, reaching to the farthest soul away. Saving, keeping love it was that found me. That is why my heart can truly say, Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful it is? to me love beyond our human comprehending love of god and christ how can it be this will be my theme and never ending great redeeming love of calvary isn't the love of jesus something wonderful Wonderful, it is wonderful. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. All right, I'm going to have Brother Tim come and uh, lead us in prayer here in just a moment. Maybe you have something else, Brother, that you might want to add to anything. We'll turn it back to you. Okay, uh, just one real quick announcement for you to pray over, think over, and kind of keep in your prayers. Uh, we are planning a youth rally of some sort. Uh, we're in the process of figuring out technologically what we can do and what that looks like, uh, because there's a bunch of different avenues we can chase down from simple, just like we're doing here tonight, live streaming, to live streaming from multiple locations, to splicing in pre-recorded videos, and whatever we decide to do gives us various options. So pray for the youth rally. Um, pastors working with Brother Don Beck and Rachel and figuring out what we can do, or Brandenburg, sorry, and figuring out what we can do and what we have access to and what we can play with. And once we have a game plan of what we can do technologically speaking, then the idiocy begins. Um, for those of you who would want to help out the day that we have it, we will be, as you know, part of the youth rally charm and joy is the six months of leftovers afterwards because we have the youth rally and in true Mayfield fashion, we don't hold a food rally unless there's enough food to feed all of Western Pennsylvania. So afterwards we have turkey and mashed potatoes and stuffing left over for that night. The Sunday afterwards, we have fellowship. The next week after that, we have fellowship. And then we send home soup of everyone just to be safe. So what we're planning on doing is the day of, we will probably meet here at the church for whomever wants to help up, help out, just run the service, make sure everything goes okay. If you want to witness it live in person, you can. And we will have turkey and such downstairs for us to munch on also, because why not? So pray for the youth rally. Pastor, did you have notes?
I'm thinking either that or we could do the old Marvin the Martian thing where we send a little pill and you drip water on it and it expands into the turkey. So one way or another, pray for our youth rally. As I've said before, we this is what we've been handed and this is the opportunity we've been given. So how can we best use it to glorify God and to accomplish his purpose? So pray. Yes. Amen. But that's about it for announcements. Uh, let's go ahead. We'll take all these to the prayer, and then we'll get into our lesson. So let's go ahead and pray. Dear most Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this night you've given to us. Lord, thank you for the privilege and the honor we have to gather around your word, Lord, and this chance to fellowship, Lord, bring our prayer requests and our praises to you, and just to abide in you. I ask you to bless all these prayer requests, Lord. We think of all the doctor's appointments and visits we have coming up in the, this week, Lord. Think of William, just continue to bless there. Think of Christopher, Lord, bless there. And all the other doctor's appointments, Lord, I ask you to work your will there. Uh, I think of this little girl, Bryn, Lord, just help the doctors as they figure out what medicine need, she needs to be on and the adjustments there and help her and give her some relief. We think of all the churches right now who are going through various revivals or meetings, Lord, or trials or tribulations. Whatever the circumstances are, Lord, perform your will. Be with each and every church, each and every pastor preaching tonight. Give them your power and your strength and wisdom, Lord, to know what to do as you will. Lord, think of all the other prayer requests. Think of those who are sick who can't be here tonight, Lord. Those who are injured, Lord, be with them. Lord, think of Cindy and her family. Give them comfort, Lord. Put your blessing upon them. And all the special unspoken, Lord, from this uh, friend's uh, mother, Lord, to just all the other unspoken. You know each and every circumstance and what needs accomplished through there. Perform your will and give us the grace to understand it. And Lord, now I ask you to bless the sermon tonight. Please move me out of the way. You, you know uh, this. it's nothing without you, Lord. So please give me your power. Give me the words you'd have me to say. Help me not to distract from your message. And may you get the glory and honor for it. And whatever happens, we'll give you the praise and glory for it. And we ask it all in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Daniel chapter number 2. Daniel chapter number 2. Daniel chapter number 2. When you get to Daniel 2, we'll pick up in verse number 10. Daniel 2, verse 10. Daniel 2, verse 10. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such a thing at any magician or astronomer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods, who so dwelling is not with flesh. For this, cause, for this cause the king was angry and very furious, and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows. Christopher came up before the service and we were talking over his book report and it brought back a lot of memories of college. Some of them pleasant, that's where I met the missus. Some of them not so pleasant because it's college, not great. And it got me to thinking. There are many times in college I ended up in trouble, whether it be behind the eight ball in work, behind the eight ball in classes, and it was of my own demise. I've told recently, I can't remember if it was behind the pulpit or just in talking normally, my freshman semester, I went into it with the guys by my parents, and my dad specifically, that I was there to study and I was going to do the best job I could. I ended my first semester of college, my first real semester of schooling, like with desks and a teacher and all that great stuff, with all A's except for one B+. Plus. That B+, plus, physical education. 
Ah, the reason why is because for our final exam, we had to run for 12 straight minutes. And as far as you got in 12 minutes was your grade. If you ran, I forget the mileage, but if you ran like two miles, you got a certain grade. If you ran like I did a few feet, collapsed on the ground and clutched your side, you did not do so well. I could ha I knew about this going into the semester. I had all semester to prepare for this run. Had I ran like a madman through the entire semester, I would have been ready and I would have done a good job and I would have gotten an A. But there's a problem with that. I don't like to run. Namely because it seems like wasted energy. I don't mind working, I don't mind working hard, but I don't want to expel that much energy just for no reason, for entertainment. I don't get it, I don't understand it, so I didn't devote myself to it as I should. Therefore, when the final exam came, I was in trouble, but I was in trouble from my own making. There was, however, another event. My senior year, after graduation, graduation at Pensacola Christian College was no joke. You went into graduation, it meant you had to sing the school hymn. The school hymn had 47 verses. If you were anything less than a senior, you were in another auditorium viewing it on the big screen. After the first verse, someone would come out and say, you are dismissed and you can leave after the first verse. If you were a sinner, uh, yeah, sinner. If you were a senior, you had to sit there and endure the 47 verses. After you got out, you still were not allowed to leave. Your room had to be spotless. It was a white glove. As those who know me and know that my, my tendencies to be a little well organized, I enjoyed such things. Scrubbing down a room, making sure every nook and cranny was dust free. I enjoyed it. I had a good time at it. But it wasn't just me living in the room. So my senior year, it wasn't just my cleaning that was holding me back. It was my roommate who decided he didn't want to touch the room until a week after school ended. And I was stuck in the room after graduation when everyone else was frolicking through the leaves. I was stuck there and not by my own devices. And it's one thing to be in a trial and a tribulation and a struggle because of something you've done. It, does, it stinks, it's miserable, but at least you can look at it and go, you know what, I dug my grave, now I have to stand it. But for trouble to come your way, when you've had absolutely no say in the mat, completely and totally arbitrary to you, that just kind of stings even more. Last week we started Daniel 2. We talked about how King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And to test his wise men, his Chaldeans, his astronomers, his sorcerers, all the people who would have come down from his father's reign to rule with him, he told them, I can't remember. You tell me the dream and you interpret it or else you die. And all of the wise men gathered around and said, you're joking, right? No one would ask that. And the king, very rationally, very maturely, says, okay, all wise men die, and the army goes out to find Daniel and his fellows to kill them. It does. The Bible doesn't say to round them up and put them in jail and eventually execute them. They were being sent out to kill them on the spot. We are all going to end up in those situations one day or another. Some of us, as I said last week, we're living through it now. We are going to have trials and tribulations and troubles that come our way that not only do we didn't cause, we don't fully understand. Daniel had no clue that the king had a dream that needed interpreted. All he knew was someone showed up at his door to kill him. Someone showed up and was going to murder him because of some reason. We are going to have those days. And what we see in the next few verses is a roadmap on how we as Christians, believing in a sacred God, can get through these events. 
a toolkit, as it were, of various things we need in order to survive these type of trials. So, let's pick up. We finished off in verse number 13, and the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Then, ans then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Aruch, the captain of the king's guard, which had gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Aruch, the king's captain, why is this decree so hasty from the king that Aruch made things known, the thing known to Daniel? If, we're going to do a hypothetical here. I don't, I'm not a big fan of hypotheticals because hypotheticals could be warped to make you feel a certain way. But if you went home tonight you got changed into your PJs, you sat on the couch, you went, church is finally over, <sighs> and someone knocked on your door and opened and said, hi there, I'm here to kill you. How many of you would respond calmly and cool-headed and level-headed? I wouldn't. A Girl Scout knocks on my door, I freak out. Unless she's waving a tag along in front of her, nah, -uh. no, 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 no. It's the greatest part about COVID. No one's allowed to knock on my door anymore. It's great. It's wonderful. It's the high point of my year. Daniel, the guy shows up at his door to kill him. And Daniel handles it with wisdom, counsel, calm. Why is this decree so hasty? Why are you coming to kill? Nice and calm. One thing I prepare all my employees for, I have since I was a store manager, is what to do if there is a literal fire in your store. When you work around fryers, I tell every new cook I work with, there's some things that are bound to happen. You are going to burn yourself at some point or another, no matter how hard you try, no matter how careful you are working around hot grease, you will burn yourself. And at some point, you will catch a fryer on fire. I've done it. Every cook I've ever known has done it. The number one problem with people who catch fryers on fire, though, is they panic. When a fryer catches fire, all you have to do is calmly turn it off, put a pan over it, smother the fire, and go about your day. What you don't want to do is scream fire, grab out a bucket of water, and chuck it at the fryer. That's not going to end well for anybody in the county. When trouble comes our way, the first step in surviving it is just remain calm. Turn with me, if you will. Keep a finger here. We're going to come back here periodically. Turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. Psalm 16. Psalm 16 is another Psalm of David. Last week we talked about the praise of David. This one we have just a regular psalm. And it's one of many psalms like it in the book of Psalm. It's a psalm of trouble. It's a psalm written when, Dan, when David was in a time of persecution, a time of being chased. We don't know the exact circumstances around it, but we know it's one where Daniel's, or David is fleeing and suffering for his life. Psalm 16. Starting in verse 1, Mitch, uh, Mitch Tom of David, preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellence in whom they is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that, has, that hasten against another God. Their drink offering of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night season. I have set the Lord always before me because he is my right hand. I shall not be moved. 
Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the paths of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. We read this recently. And it applies beautifully to this situation also, because here's David in the midst of trials and tribulation from these beings searching other gods. And what should be a psalm of distress and a psalm of terror and a psalm of God protect me and keep me safe and keep my soul out of hell, as he puts there, turns up and ends with a psalm of praise. Why? Because since he's trusting in the Lord, my soul shall not be moved. As he wrote there, again, reread down. Verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. Even though people are out to get me, David said, even though my soul is in danger, I'm not going to be moved. I'm going to rest in hope. Why? Because I've put the Lord always before me. So many times we as Christians, the world comes knocking on our door and all Satan has to do is get you to panic. Because when you panic, you'll give up anything. When you panic, you will wholesale out your morals, you'll wholesale out your standards, you'll wholesale out your convictions, you'll wholesale out your relationship in that abiding with Christ we talk about in Sunday school because you're panic. Great illustration of this. How many of you like spiders? Something is wrong with you, child. Spiders are terrible. Spiders are, you sit there and don't give me, don't give me the speech, you know, spiders are good. They help control the fly population. That's why the good Lord invented a fly swatter. I have a gun. It shoots salt. So if I see a fly across the room, I could pop it with it, and then I can also see it in my potatoes. They're, it's wonderful. It's a beautiful invention. I don't need a spider to control the fly population. I have an assault gun. As much as I don't like spiders, the missus really doesn't like spiders. One of our first dates off of campus was we went on a dating event for the college. It was canoeing. I've never been in a canoe. As you should know, I'm not a very outdoorsy type of person. Canoes aren't exact, and I'm not like built for coordination. Canoe isn't exactly something that's natural habitat for Tim. We're driving, you drive a canoe, we're floating. Whatever you do in a canoe, we're doing it down the river. There's a bunch of other dating couples googling eyeing across the canoe at each other. Occasionally, you will see these canoes veer off and touch the shore, where there are branches, trees, and various brambles, at which point, without exception, it would veer away, the woman in the canoe would scream, ah, spider, and pandemonium would ensue. Rachel, my hopefully at this point soon-to-be girlfriend, we're getting along great. We have a lot of things in common. There is that spark of chemistry. She turns around and looks at me very calmly in a manner that I would come to know after years of marriage. She would look at me and say, Tim, if we touch the shore, I'm done. This is over. Because as much as I am charming and charismatic, a spider overrules that. The panic of that spider in the boat drives everything else out. Boat's upside down, we're in the water, we're drowning because of a spider. That's a secret that Satan tries to use in your daily life. If he can get you to panic about anything, you're not going to respond calmly, coolly, or connected, collected. David is able to praise 
He's able to sing praises. He's able to end the chapter in verse 11. Thou will show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. He's able to say that because since the Lord's in front of him, he shall not be moved and his soul will rest in hope. And what I love about Psalm 16, you'll notice at the beginning, I read that little preface at the beginning, that uh, Mitch Tam of David. That word Mitch Tam has a couple meanings to it, and, but one of them is the covering of the mouth, almost like a secret. As in this is something that David and God are sharing on a personal basis. It's not something he's screaming from the rooftop. It's something in the darkest despair of his day he is praising his God with. It takes faith. It takes that hope. It takes that knowledge that God is in control and God loves us and God wants what's best for us and God is going to take care of us. So when the doors come and knock and in the bad times come, we are not panicked. A great illustration of this, if you will, flip over to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. My kiddos should remember this. Back in April, at this point, I don't know, it's 2020 is a blur. Sometime in the past, when we started back up Junior Church virtually, and I started to release Junior Church videos, this was the lesson I God put on my heart because it was what he put into my mind. Mark chapter 4, pick up reading in verse 35. Mark 4, verse 35. And the same day when even was come, he, talking about Jesus, saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full, and he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest not that thou not that we perish? And he arose, he rebuked the wind, and saith unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the waves, the wind and the sea obey him? And I've preached this for, before because I can pay, there's certain bio, stories in the Bible I can visually see, and they just tickle the ever-loving snot out of me because I find this hysterical. Jesus gets in the boat. There's the other little ships around him watching, and they set sail. Jesus has just done a lot of healing, a lot of teaching. He's had a bit of a day. So he goes to the back part of the ship. He lays down. He goes to sleep. The storm rolls up. The storm starts fighting. All the disciples come down. They wake up. Jesus Go, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to die? The Bible says Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves. Remember, Jesus is human. He is 100% God, but he does have a human nature. I can picture him shuffling up the stairs, standing on the bow of the ship, the ship's being tossed in wind and waves, and Jesus going, ah, peace be still. And shuffling back downstairs, laying back down to go to sleep. The disciples are sitting there. He looks up and goes, what? You're going to see greater things than these. He rolls over and goes to sleep, and all his disciples go, what manner of man is this? And we've preached that before, and it's a beautiful illustration of how even in the midst of the storm, if Jesus is there, there's no reason to be afraid. There's no reason. Jesus, just by a simple word, can stop the storms. But it's what comes next that's fascinating. Chapter 5, verse 1. After And they came unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the ship, immediately met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. And we know the story. The man comes out with the unclean spirit. They can't bind him. They can't trap him. They can't contain him. He is out of control with these demons. 
And Jesus calmly asked him, okay, what's your name? And they go, we are legion, for we are many. Get out. I, don't cause us just to go send us to the pigs. Okay, go take the pigs. The pigs go running over the hill. But picture, if you will, being a disciple. Stepping off to a cemetery and watching a crazy man whose torn chains is cut, beat up, come charging at you. Those of you who've gone door knocking, you've had times when the door's open and you've said to yourself, boy, what did I get myself into? I'm just going to, I'm going to slowly back up this way and let my assistant here handle it. And you turn and you don't have to run it. But you don't have to outrun the guy at the door, you just have to outrun your assistant. Jesus, I believe, was preparing his disciples with the storm, showing them that no matter what happens, no matter what come what may, if you're with me, there's nothing to worry about. If you have me before you like David did, you shall not be moved. I don't know what's going to happen this week. I can tell you from experience, it's probably not going to be great. Some of you all are going to have trials or tribulations. Some of y'all are going to have heartbreak. Some of y'all are going to have struggles. Some of y'all are going to have earth-changing events. Satan's going to try everything in it to get you to panic, to get you to run, to get you to rely on yourself and flail about. Daniel handled it with wisdom and counsel. He calmly went, and we've seen this before. We saw this in chapter 1 with the diet. He didn't freak out and go, how dare you try to make me eat meat? I'm not going to give up. No, he handled it. Oh. When trials and tribulations come, step one is to remain calm. Keep Jesus before you. Keep his, your eyes on him and remain calm. Back to Daniel. Chapter 2. So Daniel calmly asks the guy, okay, what's going on? And the man tells Daniel everything that happens. Verse number 16. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Can you imagine the guts this would take Daniel? Remember, this is very early on in his career. This is the second, reign, second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel, if he's through his three years of training, it's not by much. Daniel's a nobody, an unknown. And he goes walking into the king when he's supposed to be dead and says, okay, king, give me a, give me a minute. Give me some time. Give me a while. Remain calm, and second, allow God some time to work. This one's tough. I'm an immediate fixer type of guy. I see a problem, I want a solution to the problem. Case in point, this morning after church, me and Pastor stopped for a moment. We were talking about some technological things we want to work on, some things we want to accomplish. And downstairs in the basement, there's about a 92-inch TV. I'm not sure the exact size. All I know is it's like jumbotron size. And he would like to have it mounted on that wheeled TV cart. He said, "If I'm going to try to get here tonight a little bit early. We'll break it out. We'll see what exactly what it's going to take to mount this thing. Excellent. I came here tonight. I cleaned the church. I went downstairs. I drug this TV out through the back closet. There's spiders everywhere on the aisle. I get it out, I look at it, I go, oh, it just needs a couple screws. The church is clean. I run up the Home Depot because I'm thinking about it now. I grab some screws. I come back. I go, oh, these don't fit. I seriously contemplate running back up there to get different size screws so I can get it fixed and get it mounted before tonight's over. Do you need the TV mounted tonight? Is there any, if, if it were mounted tonight, would we accomplish anything out of it? No. It, I would feel better. I would go to bed feeling better because the TV was mounted. Because I don't like to wait. If something needs done, accomplish it, get it done, move on with your life. That's not 
how God works. God wants us to be patient. God wants us to wait on him. Again, a beautiful mirror to chapter 1 when Daniel went to the king and said, listen, I don't want to eat, I can't, well, the king's guard, and said, I can't eat the meat, it violates my principles, give me some time, let me prove that my God is real. He does the same thing. This isn't presumption, this isn't doubt, this isn't Daniel going and saying, I don't know, give me time and I'll see if I can come up with an answer. This is Daniel acknowledging that God expects us sometimes to wait. Turn with me, if you will. Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30, we're going to read for quite a bit, so strap in. Namely because whenever I, when I find a passage I want to use for a sermon, I start reading through the chapter to get context and get the meaning of the chapter in the, uh, in, meaning of the verses in the chapter. And I fell down a rabbit hole with this one. So let's start in verse number one. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel but not of me, and that cover with a covering but not my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, that walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Remember, uh, it seems like a month ago now when we started Daniel, do you remember why Nebuchadnezzar had its eyes on Jerusalem? It was because of their relationship with Egypt. And here Isaiah is warning them, listen, you are in trouble and you are seeking to fix the trouble by going to Egypt for strength. You're not looking for me to you're not looking to me for help, you're not looking to God for help. You are looking to your neighbor to the south because they appear powerful and in their, your mind they're your only solution. Verse 3, therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your, to your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. For his praise were of Zoan and his ambassadors came to Hanes. They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be in help, nor profit, but a shame and also a reproach. The burden of the beast of the south into the land of trouble and anguish from whence come the young and the old lion, the viper and the fiery serpent. They will carry their riches onto the shoulders of young asses and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to the people that shall not profit them. For Egypt shall help in vain and to not purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this. Their strength is to sit still. Now go, write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for a time to come forever and ever that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to their seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophecy, prophesy deceits, get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us, Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you have despised this word and trust in oppression and preservation and stay thereon, therefore this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready, a breach ready to fall, swelling out of a high wall, whose breaketh coming, cometh suddenly and an instant, and he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel, that is a broken piece he shall not spare, so that shall not be found in the busting of a shred, a shred to take fire from the hearth and to take water with all the pit. So to recap everything we've read, Israel's turning to Egypt because they expect them to be the solution to the point where they are willing to sell themselves to get it. Read there about how the beasts, the burdens, are taking down all their riches to Egypt to buy protection and buy solution because there's problems coming. There's an army coming against them and their immediate solution out of their panic is to buy help from Egypt. 
And the Lord says, write it down. This is going to be your doom. Write it down. This is going to be your destruction. Verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength, and ye would not. But ye said, No, for we will flee upon her horses. Therefore shall ye flee and will ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, and the rebuke of five shall ye flee, till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain, and as a sign on a hill. And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted that he have, may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. He says, you're going to run. You could have salvation if you would wait. You could have salvation if you'd be calm. You could have salvation if you could be quiet. But you won't. You're going to run to Egypt out of your panic, and that is going to be your doom. I am going to wait so that I can be gracious to you, and blessed would be you if you would just wait. Just wait. We as Christians, we are wired to fix the problem. When the troubles come into our lives, when problems come into our lives, we go into repair mode. What can Tim Winkle do to make things better? How many times have we sold our soul to Egypt because we have the solution? How many times have we given up our riches and our wealth and everything we treasure dear because it's our solution to the problem? When all God wants us to do is wait. To be calm. To be still. Be still and know that I am God. 2020 has been a year of wait. Just wait. Give it some time. But we can't do that. We have to fix the problem, Tim. We have to be the ones to correct it. If we do nothing, everything's... Just wait on Him. You don't have to turn there for time. Time is fleeting from me quickly. But Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3. I'm going to start reading verse 22. It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because His compassion fail not. They are new every morning. Great is Thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion. Save my soul. Therefore will I hope in Him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for Him. To the soul that seek Him, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. How many times has trouble come into our lives and before we start to instantly try to fix the problem, we just stop and say, God, here's the problem. What do you got in store? Here's the problem, God. What you going to do about it? And hope, knowing that He's going to, He loves us and He cares for us and He's going to take care of us. And wait. I could spend all night chalking up illustration after illustration after illustration of every time someone refused to wait on God and it met with demise. Saul, waiting to sacrifice to the Lord before battle, was told by Samuel, hold off and wait for me to come. Saul's standing there going, I can't wait anymore. He's not coming. He's forsaken us. Get me a cow. Let's do the sacrifice ourselves. Sacrificing's good. Sacrificing before a battle is even better, but the timing of it was wrong. Just because you're doing a good thing does not mean it's inherently right. We have to wait on the Lord's timing. Daniel was calm, and Daniel told the king, wait. Back to Daniel chapter 2. Back to Daniel chapter 2. 
Verse 16, Then Daniel went in and desired the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. You need to have calm. You need to have time and a willingness to wait. You need to have companions. His three friends weren't going to give him the answer. In fact, we don't even, from here on out, this is really the only time they feature in the story. But yet, as soon as he leaves the king, he goes to them. He tells them what's going on. He tells them that God has to provide an answer. He goes to his companions. I love that he even specifies that they are his companions. We are not an island unto ourselves. Despite how much some of us want to be. I'm not a, I, I don't like to ask for help. I would never ask for help if I could at all avoid it. I would be the guy learning to take his appendix out by himself because I wouldn't want to go to a doctor. I just I don't like to ask other people for help. We have a going rule at my house. If something goes wrong that I can't fix, i.e. plumbing, the missus is more than welcome to call a plumber under certain regulations. I can't know she's doing it, and they have to be there sometime when I'm not. If the toilet is broken, I go to work and it's broken, and I come home, it's fixed. I don't have to think that someone had to come to my house to fix the toilet because I am incapable of doing it. I'm a broken individual. A psychiatrist would have a field day with me on their couch. They could retire and buy a yacht. But when Daniel was in trouble, when Daniel was in need, Daniel went to his friends. Turn with me, if you will, to John 21. John 21. While you're turning to John 21, I'm going to read 1 Thessalonians to you. You're turning to John 21. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. We, we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish them, to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and, to, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, Support the weak. Be patient towards all men. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians that, in essence, we're in the work together. Nothing we do here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, any other day throughout the week is a competition against anybody else. Most of it isn't. Me and, Mrs. Me and Miss Kimberly are going to go to blows over sign language at some point. She says, I sign old style. This is not wonderful. This is what The kids know this is wonderful. Yes, it is. Yes, it was wonderful back in the 50s, but it's still wonderful. But we're not a competition here. We all have the same purpose, and that is the work of God. We're not in a competition against any other church in the county. We're not in a competition against other pastors. We're not in a competition against other ministries. We are all in the work together. John 21. I'm going to try very hard not to get too deep into this because we're eventually going to get here in Sunday school, and I love this chapter. John 21. After these things, Jesus is dead, risen from the dead, He's about to ascend to heaven. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go fishing. They say unto him, 
we also go with thee. Simon gets a lot of grief for this because he went a fishing. And people look at it as, oh, he's turning his back on the ministry. No, I, I take this very much as just a practical, the next step in the process. Their leader had died on a cross. Their leader had been brandished a traitor and a blasphemer and was crucified, and then the body disappeared. Their support system would have dried up by this point. They would have been slightly exiled. This is Simon going, the only thing I know how to do at this point is fish to survive. Let's go fishing. And when he said it, all the disciples that were with him said, yeah, we'll help out. Verse number three, Simon Peter said, I'm going to go fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto him, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and that ye shall find. They cast therefore now there were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, the disciples whom Je that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisherman's coat upon him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. They're out fishing all night. When it says that Peter was naked, it does not mean he was just completely naked. It means that he was hot while working, so he took off his outer garb. He would be in such a state that would be unfit to be before his master. But when he finds out Jesus is on shore, that becomes his sole priority. He forgets the fishes. He forgets everything that's behind him. He jumps out. He grabs his coat. He jumps out of the water and he beelines it to be with his Savior. And the other disciples come alongside to help carry the fish. It's an estimated 400 pounds of fish they caught that night. The Bible numbers them, 153 fish. The other disciples came by in a little boat to help carry the fish to shore. Peter dove out to go see the Savior. It was up to the other disciples to help carry in the fish. That's deep. Peter had completely forgotten what would turn out to be the biggest catch of his life because he wanted to be near his Savior. He forgot absolutely everything else, but they needed the food. This was going to be their food, their survival for a while, the other disciples were willing to stay on the back burner, take a little longer to get there to help carry in the fish. We're all in the work together. It's okay if someone comes along and helps reap what you've planted. It's okay if someone else gets the glory for dragging in the fish. It's okay to turn to someone and say, I can't lift this net by myself. Can I get some help? That's okay. That's not only okay, that is encouraged. Daniel said, I don't know the answer. Before I do anything else, let me go to Hananiah, Azarel, Mishael, and get some help. To fill them in, to get their support. You need to remain calm. You need to give the Lord time to work. And you need your companions. Every one of you should have a number on speed dial. When the trouble comes into your life, you can call for advice. If not, Satan loves to pick off the sheep by itself. Satan loves because when you're alone, that's when the panic can set in. Get someone who can calmly talk you off the ledge. 
You need to be calm. You need to wait on the Lord. You need companions. Back to Daniel chapter 2. Verse 18. That they would des desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. In order to get through the trials and tribulations of this life, plainly put, you need mercy. You need mercy. We don't deserve anything. We don't deserve to have a church to come to to worship. We don't have, deserve to have companions to reach out to in time of need. We don't deserve anything. I read it in Lamentations whenever we were talking about waiting on Him. It's because of His mercies. We're not consumed from day to day. We need His mercy. You're here tonight and you're saved. You have acknowledged this. You've realized that you're saved by grace, which is the other side of the coin to mercy. We understand that it's by His mercies that we're saved. We understand that it's by His mercies we achieve anything. And while this point may seem like a slam dunk of, okay, I'll just take His mercies, His mercies have a stipulation. Turn with me if you will. Flip over to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Verse number 30. Luke chapter 6. Verse number 30. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and to him that taketh away thy good, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye likewise also to them. For if ye love them which love you, what thanks have ye? For sinners also love those that love thee. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thanks have ye? For sinners also do even the same. If ye lend to them that whom ye have hoped to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners and receive as much again. But love as you, love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Judge not that ye be not judged. Condemn not and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Give, as it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall man give into your bosom? For with the same measure that ye meet with fall, it shall be measured to you again. Be ye merciful, as the Father also is merciful. You have received mercy. When the trials and tribulations come into your life, even if you have not caused anything to cause them, if you're willing to be calm and you're willing to trust in Him and you're willing to give Him time and you're willing to go to your companions, you will receive His mercy. And all He asks in return is we mirror it out to the rest of the world. We give without reservation. We give not expecting back. We forgive. We judge not. We don't condemn. We love. And we're right back to John 14 and 15. Where in order for us to properly display the mercy we receive, we in turn spread it to the world. And I love that that verse is tacked on to the end of this because we like that verse. Given it shall be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, literally packed full as much as you can. There's an ice cream place I'm in love with now. I'm going to Tim Winkle talking about food again. Yay! There's an ice cream place in Beaver called Which Flavor? 
Is there a possible tie to paganism? All I know is they have a cannoli ice cream that's phenomenal. What I love most about them is if you order a pint of ice cream, they fill it up, but they don't just fill it up. They put a thing. Michelle, have you been there? Glory. Now we're excited. They take a piece of parchment paper. They put it on top of the ice cream so they can then take the lid and jump up and down on it to see how much ice cream they can pack in a pint. It's the five guys of ice cream. You go to five guys to get fries. They put the tub of fries in, and then they take about six pans and dump fries on top of it. That's the idea of this giving that we want so badly, that we, give, we can't outgive God. You give, he's going to give back. But did you catch where that's going to be given from? Let's reread that. Verse number 38. Given it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. Shall men. That good measure and everything is us giving out because when you give it, others will give it back to you. If you're being stingy with what you have, if you're being stingy with your mercy, and you're looking at others who are living in sin, and you're going, how dare you? You are dead to me. Get saved, then we'll talk. Until then, be gone with you. You're not going to get anything in return. If you're hoarding what you have and saying, this is mine, I, if I give it, I will have less. You're not getting anything in return. We want to have that mercy. We desire mercy. Every morning I wake up, I pray God is merciful to me because if not, I'm in trouble. But in order to receive that mercy, I have to dole it out just as He's merciful. You need to be calm. You need to be still and wait on Him. You need companions. You need to have mercy. Mercy. Back to Daniel 2. Time is fleeting. I've got two more points. Back in verse 18. That they would des desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Part of Daniel's goal was for him not to perish. Part of his goal was for his companions not to perish. But part of his goal was for the other wise men not to perish. These are as far from Christians as you can get. These are people who are actively serving, worshiping, and sacrificing to other gods. And Daniel is concerned for them. He's concerned for their safety. Because not only do you need that calm, not only do you need time, not only do you need companions, not only do you need mercy, you need to have compassion. You need to have compassion. It would be easy for Daniel to look and say, this is our opportunity to take the children from Jerusalem and move them up into power. This would be the opportunity for us four to become rulers. Let's allow everyone else to be done away with. I will go in and I will say, my God has delivered an answer. These people failed. Kill them. But Daniel was worried about them. We all know Jude and some having compassion making a difference. Compassion is a trait that is very quickly dying amongst Christians. We have become so hard and so numb to people in need. We have become so blatantly stiff-necked. Anybody who's outside of our circle if someone in here is in pain, absolutely we'll help out. If one of y'all needs something, 
we'll bend over backwards to help each other, but as soon as those who are outside start to need it, well, they brought it upon themselves. Did you see what they posted on Facebook? They had this coming. Turn with me if you will. Zechariah chapter 7. Zechariah chapter 7. Zechariah. For those of you who are in junior church, you know how this works. You got Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah. Zechariah. I'll give you a little extra time to get there. Zechariah chapter 7. Once you get there, we're going to pick up in verse number 8. Zechariah chapter 7, verse number 8. And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of the hosts, saying, Execute true judgment and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, nor the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken and pull away the shoulder and stop their ear that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of the hosts have sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it is come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cried, I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. Oh, that's a condemnation. Zechariah is told by God to the children of Israel, be merciful and have compassion. But since they didn't want to hear it, since they stopped their ears and hardened their hearts and turned their backs on people, just like their cries were ignored, Israel's cries would be ignored. The world is begging for compassion right now. Begging. There are people across the globe who are hurting and they want our compassion. And we're perfectly fine giving it as long as they agree with me. But as soon as they are disagreeing with me, as soon as we question their motives, as soon as we question the intent of their heart, we therefore then we get to rob them of our compassion. And whatever happens to them is of their own devices. And we have robbed ourselves of compassion. And someday we are going to be in their shoes. And what's God going to do to us? I told you back whenever this whole thing started in March, I fired up my Facebook again. I didn't like it. I didn't want to. But it was the way I could attend church and fellowship of all y'all. And I could sit in the chat and tell jokes about not sticking plastic bags over your face. And putting your phone in the microwave was frozen. Good times. I miss March. I found the secret to making Facebook bearable for those days when I was on it. If you, would, if you somehow annoyed me, I could just unfollow. I would still be your friend, but I just didn't have to listen to you talk. I unfollowed a bunch of people. Not because they said something I disagreed with. Not because they said something that offended me. I would unfollow people when they refuse to show compassion. When people who are suffering and in need, and Christians and churches should be that beacon, that lighthouse pastor was talking about earlier in our community, and we are withholding our compassion because they brought it amongst themselves. They brought this on themselves, therefore they deserve it. The wise men, the astronomers, the Chaldeans, they deserve to die. 
They were unable to answer the king because they were serving rocks instead of God. They had hitched their cart to false gods, and whenever those false gods could not deliver, they should reap the punishment thereof. But yet Daniel was still worried about them. Ouch. How many times in the Gospels, whenever God would be ready to perform a miracle, did it start with the phrase, and He was moved with compassion upon them? The feeding of the 5,000, the five loaves and two fishes. You know what started the whole thing? They were in the desert. He was praying. He looked out. He saw a crowd. And the Bible says He was moved with compassion. These people that when Jesus was dying on the cross would be screaming, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. He was moved with compassion. Maybe instead of voicing our outrage, maybe we voice a little bit of compassion. We're going to need it someday. Crying out loud, we need it now. We need to be calm. We need to have time to let God work. We need to have companions. We need to have mercy. We need to have compassion. And lastly, turn back, if you will, to Daniel. Verse 19. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. And Daniel blessed the Lord God of heaven. We're going to get into that blessing the Lord God of heaven next week. There's a whole sermon tied up in that. But did you notice where the answer came from? In a night vision. Daniel got the answer in a dream. If someone kicked out your home, you're in your PJs, you have your midnight snack, someone kicks open the door and says, I am here to kill you, you will die tonight. And you go, hold on, let me buy some time. Give me some time, let me come up with an answer. I don't know if I would be able to go home and get my 40 winks. I would be sitting there staring at the ceiling going, what am I going to do next? Daniel went back, talked to his companions, asked for mercy, showed compassion, and then he rested. He was willing to rest. I've used a great illustration before. When you're driving in a car, when can you fall asleep in a car? When you trust the driver. If I went out and I let Christopher, who I've never seen drive before, I'm sure you're a wonderful driver, but if I were to hop in a car, if I would go, okay, Christopher, I realize this is the first time behind the wheel. Have fun. That shows I trust him. That shows I'm willing to let myself completely out of the equation and let you take over. Daniel was so confident that God would provide an answer, he was willing to rest. We've spent a lot of time in Psalms the last two weeks. Let's end up there tonight. Flip over, if you will, last place. I'll be turned to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Verse number one. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desire of thy heart. Commit thy ways unto the Lord. Trust also to him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man that bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself any wise to do evil. David says, you worried about people coming after you? 
You're worried about trouble. You're worried about stress. You're worried about people causing you grief. Rest in Him. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall bring it to pass. He'll bring your salvation. Wait upon Him and rest. All Satan has to do is tire you out. Tired Jew isn't as effective for God. If Satan can discourage me and wear me down, guess what? Junior church is going to be rougher to do. If Satan tires and wears pastor out, he's not going to be any use to God because he's whipped. Do your due diligence. Handle any problem calmly, Give God time to work. Trust and wait in Him. Put Him before you and the hope of His salvation before you and wait on Him. Go to your companions. Share your burden with them. Ask God for His mercy. Be merciful to others so you receive the mercy and have compassion and ask God for compassion. And after you've done everything you can do, Go, God, I've put it in your hands. I've done all I can do. And allow him to work. Some of us are so gripped tight waiting for an answer that God can't give us that night vision. Some of us are so concerned and waiting and nervous and panicked that God can't give us the answer. Rest. It's okay. We've built a society and a nature to where, and this is the proof of it, if Sunday afternoon you go home, you sit on the couch and you take a nap, if someone calls you, wakes you up to sleep, out of sleep, and you answer the phone, hello? And they ask, were you sleeping? Every one of us is going to say the same thing. No, I wasn't sleeping. All of us. I have a routine to where if someone calls me at 2 o'clock in the morning, the first thing I do, me, 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 and I try to get the sleep out of my voice so it doesn't sound like I'm sleeping. It's 2 a.m. Everyone should be sleeping. But we have built a nature to, I know, except for Miss Kimberly and Rachel, you're not allowed to sleep at 2 a.m. We have built a nature to where resting is unmanly. How dare you rest? Don't you realize there's work to do? Don't you realize there's stuff to be accomplished? It's okay you rest in Him. Because when you're resting, you're showing full confidence that God's got it. You've done all your due diligence. You've done everything you can do. You've handled it calmly. You're waiting on the Lord. You've asked for mercy. You've shown compassion. You've shown it to your friends. You've brought your companions into it. You've done everything you can. That's just rest. We're going to find out next week Spoiler for those of you who haven't read ahead yet. Daniel's going to live. It'd be a crummy book if Daniel dies two chapters in. Daniel's going to survive this problem. He's going to survive it because he handled it calmly. He handled it with calm, cool. He didn't panic. He didn't go flying off the handles. He didn't get his temper. He handled it calmly. He went and he asked for time. He let God work. He was willing to wait on Him. He was willing to wait on the Lord. Then he went and he brought his companions on board. He went to his friends. He said, listen, here's the problem. I need your help. They went to God and they asked for mercy. They went to God and they showed compassion for others. And then they rested and the solution came. Some of us are in the middle of a trial and tribulation. Some of us are in the middle of a battle right now. Are we willing to rest? Are we willing to handle it calmly? Are we willing to give it time? Are we willing to bring in friends? Are we willing to have mercy and compassion? When we do, God's going to come through. Always. My God never fails. He will not cause us to lose. We just have to be willing to put it in His hands. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking about. You're here tonight and you are in trouble. 
I don't know the circumstances. I don't know the problems. I don't know what's up in your life. Maybe you haven't handled it as calmly as you should. Maybe you've panicked. Maybe you've gotten angry. Maybe you've gotten upset. Whatever the circumstances, you have not handled it with that calm and compassion you needed to. Maybe you're not willing to wait on the Lord. Maybe the problem's here and I want a solution now. And if God's not going to give me a solution, I'm going to go to Egypt and find my own solution. Maybe you're trying to be an island to yourself. You're afraid to bring others in to show weakness. Maybe you aren't being merciful. Maybe you're expecting the mercy to come to you, but you're refusing to give it up. And maybe you're showing no compassion for anybody else. You're just focused on you, you, you. Or maybe you're just so tense you refuse to rest and let God work. I'm going to pray. The altar is going to be open. We're going to have a few moments of silence. Take it to the Lord. Dear Most Heavenly Father, we thank you for staying given to us. Lord, thank you for this opportunity and the privilege we've had to come gather around your word, Lord. Thank you that we do have illustrations of when problems come and when headaches come and what we need to do to handle it, Lord. May we respond to it as you would have us. Whatever happens, we're going to give the praise, the honor, and glory for it. In your son Jesus' name, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking about. The altar's open for you. Your pew's open for you. If you're at home on your couch, your couch is open for you. Take it to the Lord. Dear Most Heavenly Father, we again thank you for tonight, Lord. Thank you for all you've done today. May you receive the glory and honor for absolutely everything that's accomplished. And whatever happens, we'll give you the praise and glory for it. And we ask it all in your Son, Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. It is greatly appreciated. Uh, your personal endorsement for tonight is which flavor ice cream? Um, I'm a fan of the holy cannoli personally, but the uh, cookies and cream is also something to be reckoned with. So... Let's go and stand. We'll dismiss in a word of prayer. We'll be back Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, for the midweek Bible study. Make sure to keep each other in your prayers. Joe, go and dismiss us in a word of prayer, please, sir. Amen, and you are dismissed.